So thank you for that generous introduction. Um, it's really an honor to be here and to see so many people here. Uh, the, the senior seminar class had a conference today and the, the papers were wonderful and it's been a real delight to be here. And I want to thank the philosophy department, the class, and Professor um, Block Schulman for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, I'll go ahead and dive in. I'll, I'll uh, talk for about, hopefully no more than about 45 minutes so that we have time for, for conversation and questions. And the title of my paper, get too loud here. The title of my paper is I love myself when I'm what? Uh, the cost of white privilege, white habits, and white ignorance. So that the title is taken, as some of you might know, from the collection of Zora Neale Hurston's essays in fiction edited by Alice Walker called I Love Myself When I'm Laughing and Then Again When I'm Mean and Impressive. Perhaps best known for her novel Their Eyes Were Watching God, Hurston's nonfiction essays and articles offer equally valuable affirmations of African-American life and of black Southern life in particular. Hurston's literary work and political positions have been neglected and misunderstood many times, especially in comparison with great African-American race men such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Richard Wright. But what stands out clearly in Hurston's work is her refusal to apologize for being black and her rejection of the idea of blackness as an affliction. As Hurston explains, quote, I do not belong to the sobbing school of Negrohood who hold that nature somehow has given them a low down dirty deal, end quote. It's no tragedy to be black on Hurston's view and her work is filled with strong criticism of those white or black who think that quote, great sorrow must be dammed up in a black person's soul. Now if Hurston's multifaceted work in life could be boiled down to just one thing, it would be self-affirmation where the self here is not an isolated individual, but a self transactionally constituted, that means in sort of a dynamic back and forth, constituted uh, with its environment by the race, gender, class, regional uh, differences in, in an environment. Hurston loves herself, period. It doesn't matter whether she's laughing, angry, intimidating, or whatever. This self-love fueled by joyful affirmation is incredibly powerful making Hurston sometimes seem outrageous. What Walker writes about their eyes were watching God could be said of Hurston's entire body of work, quote, this is Walker now talking about Hurston, there's enough self-love in that one book, love of community, culture, traditions, to restore a world or to create a new one, end quote. It was and still is outrageous uh, in white dominated America for a black woman to think that she could change the world but Hurston, quoting Walker again on her, Hurston refused to be humbled by second place in a contest she did not design, end quote. So what then about those white people for whom the contest is designed? What should their relationship to their raced selves be? Now I say raced selves, even though that's an awkward kind of way of putting it, but I say that since striving for so-called colorblindness is a bankrupt and harmful strategy for white people to pursue. At this historical moment, white people cannot avoid being white, even though they might and often do try to evade it. That is their race, their whiteness. And even though white people are never simply white, but they're intersectionally constituted by gender, class, and other salient axes of human experience. So it's never whiteness simpliciter, but there it is, uh, their whiteness. Now given the destructive history and present of white supremacy and white privilege, it would seem that a white person could not take up Hurston's words and proclaim that she or he also loves her white self. What could it mean for a white person to affirm her whiteness? I mean, what is it? Just saying that cannot sound outrageous. What would this inevitably and necessarily mean that that white person loves racism and white superiority and white privilege? Now, I'm going to argue that the answer to this question is no, or at least it's not necessarily the case that affirming, a white person's affirming herself has to mean affirming racism and white supremacy, white privilege. But before elaborating that, let me address the way, the ways that habits of white privilege tend to operate in the late 20th and early 21st century, because that mode of operation has changed over the years. So part of this is what are we even talking about when we're talking about whiteness? And I wanna talk about this in terms of habits, habits of white privilege. Now habits are the things we do and say without thinking, so to speak. They are the psychosomatic, that is, the inseparably mental and physical patterns of engagement with the world that operate without conscious attention or reflection. They tend to fly under a person's conscious radar, so to speak. 
And they're all the more effective precisely because they tend to function unnoticed. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, talking about habit in general. Human beings could never survive if, for example, they had to consciously guide every muscular movement that it takes to get out of bed in the morning. While the non-conscious aspect of habit enables organic flourishing, it also can limit it by allowing all sorts of destructive habits to operate undetected. White privilege is one such habit. White privilege is not just a non-conscious habit, however. I'm going to distinguish that term, uh, and I, I, we won't spend a lot of time just distinguishing terms here, but I want to make sure we're distinguishing non-conscious from unconscious. So white habit is not just non-conscious, something that often happens to go unnoticed. It often is an unconscious habit, actively working to disrupt attempts to reveal its existence and thus to be able to change it. Now this helps explain how white privilege both functions as if invisible and increases its power precisely by operating as if non-existent. This hasn't always been the case, or at least I argue. 100 years ago, for example, or you know, we could pick a number of different time periods, but think back to when Jim Crow reigned in the United States. White domination tended to be fairly easily visible to all. Visible, spoken about, photographed. Lynchings were well-attended social affairs for white people, for example, who openly celebrated the vicious hangings of black people with picnics, photographs to proudly send to friends and family. After the civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s, the movement from de jure to de facto racism meant not the end of white domination, but a significant shift in its predominant mode of operation. It was no longer socially acceptable in most white circles and institutions to openly proclaim racist beliefs, and that's true today. The good, that is non-racist white person, was supposed to treat everyone equally, which is taken to mean not noticing a person's race at all. In this atmosphere of alleged color blindness, so I, I don't see race, I just see people, racism continued and continues to function without the use of race-related terms. Race supposedly is not at issue in a society that obsesses over urban ghettos, crime, the resale value of one's house, welfare queens, the drug war, death penalty, and a massively growing prison industry. We can understand this phenomenon as an example of the epistemology of ignorance, which I won't spend a lot of time on, but, but you know, here's a touch point for that concept for those of you familiar with it. What does that mean? Epistemology is the study of how we know things. So we're talking about how ignorance is part of what we know about the world. So an epistemology of ignorance in which white people cannot understand how race and whiteness structures the racist world that they live in, benefit, and help to create. So the shift from a formal to a de facto informal racism, in other words, a sort of legal racism to uh, right, all the Jim Crow laws now, I think that's more or less true, are off the books. So that shift from formal to informal racism corresponds with a related shift from habits of white supremacy, or what I'll call habits of white supremacy, to habits of white privilege. Now, as I'm using the term, we talked a little bit about this today, I'm going to use the term white supremacy to refer to conscious, deliberate forms of white domination, such as those found in the law, but also found in informal social mores. Although racist groups such as the Ku Klux Klan and Aryan Nation offer some of the most obvious examples of white supremacy, one need not be a member of groups like that to be a white supremacist, at least on the way that I'm using that term. All you need, so to speak, is a style of interacting with the world in which white domination is consciously embraced and affirmed. Now, white supremacy has not disappeared with the end of legalized Jim Crow racism. And uh, I'm, I won't talk much about it, but I'm thinking here of Dylan Roof and the, 2000, the June 2015 Charleston church shootings, for example. As long as white domination endures, there probably always will exist a mix of white supremacy and white privilege on both the micro level of the person and the macro level of societies, cultures, politics, nations. But that mix is one with increasingly high proportions of unconscious white domination in a lot of Western democracies in particular. While big booted forms of conscious oppression still exist in the early 20th first century, white domination tends to prefer silent tiptoeing rather than loud stomping. Now I'm gonna turn now to a specific set of habits of white privilege, what I'll call affective habits, think emotional habits, affect emotion. 
And I do so because affect is fundamental. It's fundamental to what animates and motivates person. And I, I'm going to say something about that um, in a general way, and then I will connect it back to race and white privilege in particular. I'm going to argue that white people need to make a positive contribution to racial justice, and their contribution needs to be something other than a short-lived gesture that ultimately serves to alleviate white guilt rather than to eliminate racial injustice. How are white people more likely to engage in sustained action, be that political, personal, institutional, or otherwise? How are they more likely to engage in sustained action that actually counters white domination? The answer lies, to a large extent, in the affective habits that constitute them. So like other habits, as I'm using the term habit and affect, affects help make up the selves that we are, and also the capacities, the abilities, that we have to act in and engage with the world. I'm not opposed to the term emotion, and I'll, for these purposes, probably use them kind of interchangeably, but I often prefer the term affect, since emotion tends to connote an opposition to reason. So. Uh, this shows up in philosophy a lot anyway. You've got reason and mind over here. You've got emotion connected with body over here, and these are opposed. So emotion, if it connotes that kind of opposition, I'm concerned about the term. I do not want to be operating with that kind of opposition and the mind-body dualism that goes with it. Given the hegemony of reason and mind in traditional Western philosophy, emotion sometimes can be um, treated dismissively as mere feeling, it's just something you're feeling. It doesn't give you knowledge, for example. It's not valuable epistemologically. The term affect perhaps does a better job of interrupting conventional dismissals of the felt embodied aspects of human life. The concept of affect also does a better job of recognizing that affects are con constitutive of the self. Affects are not ontologically trivial or secondary to some other allegedly primary part of the self, nor are affects layered on top of a rational core. They cannot be adequately understood in the traditional dualism between emotion and reason, or feeling and thinking. That's the other way it often plays out, the dualism. So I want to talk about affects. I'm thinking here joy, love, hate, shame, resentment, and I'll be talking about some of these in particular. They help constitute whatever's fundamental to us as selves, including our judgments of and responses to the world. So as I'm talking about affective habits, I'm talking about things that are infused with intelligence and discrimination in the uh, not in the sense of racial discrimination, but in the sense of picking things out in the world. They're forms of embodied thinking that operate primarily non-consciously and sometimes even unconsciously, but they're not meaningless outbursts made by a body sharply separated from the mind. We can, on occasion, become consciously aware of our affects and the judgments they put forth, but the making of those judgments tends to happen apart from reflective thought. But the non-reflective dimension of affect does not necessarily make it irrational on my account. The relevant distinction here is not between irrational affect versus reason, but between non-conscious and unconscious thought on the one hand and conscious reflective thought on the other. It's a distinction rather than a sharp dualism indicating that affective and re reflective thinking can be complementary. And I'm spending some time on this. I'm going to move away from it pretty quickly back to talking specifically about white privilege. Um, but I am going to be talking about what emotions, what affects motivate white people and I think this has political significance. And so I want to make sure that as we're talking about emotions and affects, it doesn't sound like something that's just navel gazing, you know, this kind of introspective, how am I feeling? And who gives a flip about how white people are feeling, you know, in this context? So I'm not talking about mere feeling in that dismissive sense, but something that I think has political implication. One last distinction here. And I, um, well, a few, more, a few more general things about habit, and then I will move an effective habit, and I will move then back to white privilege. So I'm thinking about the energetic dimension of affect and emotion and the powerful, full of power dimension of affect and the ability to sustain ongoing action. And here I'm going to follow, I'm not going to talk much about it, but I'm following a philosopher named Spinoza who distinguishes negative affects, sometimes he calls them sad passions, from positive or joyful ones. The really key thing here is that this distinction is not based on moral judgment. Negative here does not mean morally bad, and positive does not mean morally good. The distinction instead refers to quantities of power, with power understood as the ability to act. That's what I'm trying to get at here with affect. 
While both positive and negative affects have an energetic dimension, negative affects ultimately deplete a person's energy for further action, while positive affects tend to build up a person's energy, enabling ongoing sustained activity. Negative affects tend to result in a lack of power, a lack of an ability to act, while positive affects tend to make a person powerful, full of power. In either type of affect, what is primarily, primarily at issue is not how one feels, but what one is psychosomatically capable or incapable of doing. Now, because negative affects deplete or diminish the body's effect, active energies, they might seem to make a person innocuous, you know, not really capable of affecting much of anything, but I think the result is the opposite. A body constituted by negative affects is something like Friedrich Nietzsche's last man, too spiritually or psychosomatically depleted to do much that is active, yet extremely dangerous because he or she resents others' liveliness and reacts by trying to destroy them. Now this, I believe, describes the general, not that Nietzsche talked about this, but it describes the general historical and contemporary situation of white people. Even though they, we, white people, typically have been in a position of racial dominance, because white people have been racially constituted by negative affects, such as what? Think here, fear, greed, and hatred with relationship to people of color, black people in particular, but, but more broadly. White people, in terms of their whiteness, I want to argue generally, are weak. Now, as a result, they have been and are viciously destructive of others. White people need to become psychosomatically strong enough that they do not poison other races when interacting with them, but instead are capable of reciprocally nourishing each other. I'm, and I'm going to make some, I'm just going to dive in here and make, some of these claims are going to sound, um, strange, <laughs> provocative, I'm just going to dive in and hopefully it's going to make sense by the end. So I'm going to argue white people need to become more, not less selfish if they're really going to do some kind of sustained meaningful work in connection with racial, just, racial justice movements. And by that I mean they need to adorn their souls with genuine treasures rather than the counterfeit gems of white privilege and white supremacy. Only then will they be in an affective ontological position to fairly, generously, and even lovingly engage with others rather than respond to them out of a soul-starved stinginess. Now, today, um, I mean, in some longer versions of this, I talk historically about fear and hatred and greed and try and give some concrete examples of how these have constituted white people's uh, relationship with other people. But um, Today, it's not so much those set of, of emotions and affects that are openly affirmed for white people. It tends to be guilt and especially shame. These are the recommended, generally recommended affective compo comportments for white people who care about racial justice. Uh, quoting one philosopher, uh, contemporary philosopher, quote, a certain kind of feeling bad can be important for producing meaningful solidarity across difference and she's thinking racial difference here in particular, particularly for individuals who benefit from racist social political structures. And she goes on to say some of those bad feelings might include, quote, guilt, anger, sadness, panic, shame, embarrassment, and other emotions not easy to name. Uh, and, and, there, and there are a number of other um, philosophers and other theorists who talk about guilt and now more often shame as um, not just appropriate for white people to feel in the face of, of histories and presence of, of racial atrocities, but that this would be the emotional or affective basis for their work engaging in racial justice, racial justice movements. So in, I'm concerned, however, that effective habits of white guilt and shame ultimately tend to be counterproductive for anti-racist movements. Now this is so for at least two reasons. First, in the case of white people's contributions to racial justice movements, I'm skeptical that effective habits of guilt and shame can sustain the ongoing difficult political work of changing institutional structures and practices that perpetuate white privilege and domination. The personal here in the form of affect and ontology is related to the political, and negative affects generally are insufficient for motivating and sustaining meaningful efforts on the part of dominant groups to make political change. Now, guilt and shame about white racism on the part of white people might lead, and sometimes I grant have led white people to do something to fight white racism. But I'm doubtful that guilt and shame can support much more than a brief gesture that ultimately serves more to relieve white people of their racially effective burdens of guilt and shame 
than to further racial justice. I'm worried, in other words, that guilt and shame in terms of the helpful, productive work that they're doing in the world turn out to be a difference of degree, but not kind, from some of the other so-called sad passions that have constituted white people, fear, anger, greed. So whether negative affects in question are white guilt and shame or white hatred and fear, the issue of negative versus positive affects is not one of personal feelings at the expense of political action. The question of which affects constitute white people is intimately connected, not antithetical to the issue of white people's ability to bring about institutional, institutional and political change regarding race. So in my view, positive affective habits, and I'm gonna focus on love here in just a minute, as a form of critical affirmation. So I'm thinking of love um, somewhat in the sense that Hurston has talked about affirmation. I think these will better provide the affective soil in which the roots of effective white action for racial justice can grow. So support for my concern about the affective habits of guilt and shame is found in empirical work indicating that shame of all types regularly leads to destructive forms of hostility and rage, which in turn tend to generate more anger in response. This, the result is often what, often is what psychologist Helen Lewis called the shame-rage spiral, a negative spiral of contagion in which my destructive emotions encourage your destructive emotions, shame into rage into shame, which feed back into my increasing destructiveness and so on. As sociologist Thomas Sheff's research indicates, shame tends to lead to blame and violence, which threatens social ties. This means rather than strengthen positive connections between people, quoting Sheff, shame marks social fragmentation, one person turning away from the other. I should mention here that I'm talking specifically about shame in Western contexts that tend to be pretty individualistic. There's an interesting separate conversation that I won't have here about how shame can function in some Asian cultures that tend to be less individualistic. And I say that not intending to stereotype or too quickly generalize about Asian cultures, which can be very different from each other. But that it's an interesting conversation because there is some data that shame can um, operate in some more positive ways in those cultures. And yet when I've talked about that with um, students who are Asian and scholars who are Asian, they also caution that it's not so clear shame works in positive ways there either. But in either case, in any case, I'm talking about shame here. Think about the United States. Think about Western cultures. The data I'm citing draws from those and pretty, indi pretty clearly indicates that shame tends to tear up cultures, fragment them. Now, extending Lewis's landmark work on the shame-rage spiral, psychologist Jane Tang Tangney and her colleagues more recently have demonstrated, quote, that the tendency to experience shame was significantly positively correlated with measures of anger and indices of indirect hostility, irritability, resentment, and suspicion, end quote. So as these indices suggest, a shamed anger is not what Bell Hooks has written about as a healing rage, a kind of anger that might repair the world, heal the world. It's not operating in that way. Shame. Uh, tends to operate instead as um, what uh, the psychologist and her colleagues, to op uh, they, they call a humiliated fury. No wonder then that shame-prone individuals, quote, appear to have significant liabilities in their management of interpersonal hostility and anger. Not only are they more likely to feel shame, but once angered, they're more likely to manage their anger in an unconstructive fashion, end quote. The array of toxic actions and emotions empirically to re related to shame is devastating. Now I'm quoting again here the results of some of this work. Malevolent intentions, direct, indirect, and displaced aggression, self-directed hostility, and projected negative long-term consequences of everyday episodes of anger, end quote. So far from promoting greater responsibility on the part of wrongdoers, shame, I think, tends to motivate them to harm other people even more. The second reason I think promoting white guilt and shame generally is counterproductive to racial justice movements is that these affects tend to turn white anti-racist efforts into a narrow quest for white moral salvation. So this is a very different reason, but the, in my mind the two together just make me very concerned that saying shame is going to be the affective basis out of which white people are going to act and try and make some sort of positive change in the world. 
Rather than achievement of racial justice, relief from racial guilt and shame seems to be what's at stake for many white people in their dealings with people of color. This, is an, this goes without saying, but this is an inappro inappropriate and unfair burden for white people to ask them to bear. As Thurgood, Thurgood, Marshall, Thurgood Marshall once said, quote, you know, sometimes I get awfully tired of trying to save the white man's soul, end quote. White people's souls may indeed need saving, and I don't mean here in the sense of looking for an afterlife. I'm talking about what kinds of effects they're having in this world here and now. They may need saving, but to demand that black and other non-white people be the vehicle for white salvation merely replicates the racial inequalities and abuses that led to their damnation. As feminist sociologist Sarita Srivastava has documented in her research on white feminists and white women in particular, in anti-racist organizations. White women tend to, quote, become mired in self-examination and stuck in deliberations on morality and salvation. Still quoting, not surprisingly, this ethical transformation is still framed by the poles of good versus evil, now newly interpreted as the fraudulent non-racist versus the authentic anti-racist, end quote. Now, I'm gonna ret I'll return later to the point about the ethical framing of good versus evil in the context of white anti-racism. Here I want to point out that self-examination can take many forms, not all of which result in a mired or stuck self. The turn to oneself, the selfishness that I talked about and I'm going to come back to, that kind of self-examination that I wish to encourage is a process in which a white person would effectively reconstitute and transform herself, not a self-examination undertaken to reassure her existing self by satisfying, quote, this is Srivastava, her desire for innocence, racial innocence. So instead of being constituted primarily by affective habits of white guilt and shame, white people who want to work toward racial justice need to be fueled by a love for or affirmation of themselves and other white people. Now, I deliberately say love themselves and other white people rather than love other people, white and non-white, or love everyone because I'm concerned about cross-racial universal love being used by white people as an evasion of the meaning and effects of their whiteness and thus as an extension of their white privilege. I, I don't have time for it here. I could say more later. Um, but I'm concerned about encouraging white people to, 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 bef to befriend people of color as an anti-racist strategy. I'm not arguing that love and friendship between people of different races can't happen. It does and it's important. I'm concerned about using it as a tactic or a strategy. Um, some of the materials I've seen, um, and these were used in, not in Charlotte, but where I was before, a couple of years ago, were booklets for white people wanting to you know, have sort of consciousness raising groups, trying to do something connected with racism, and they ended kind of chirpily at the end, don't forget to go out and make friends with a black person. Um, and that was one of the concrete strategies for, for trying to make a change in the world. And so I'm really, really concerned about friendship and a kind of friendship orthodoxy being misused here in the service of white people's moral salvation. So again, I'm not arguing that white people and people of color never should love each other or be friends. I'm arguing, I'm urging, that white people need to stop overly focusing on people of color when they consider how to combat racial injustice. This is part of the selfishness or turn to self. More than anything, white people need to turn to themselves and clean up the crap in their own house. Now, I realize this suggestion might seem to only exacerbate white domination, white racism, the specific problem of the white quest for racial salvation. I mean, aren't white people already too focused on themselves? Although sometimes without realizing it, because when whiteness goes unnamed, it can seem that whiteness isn't at issue, and yet it can be there all at the same time. Don't they need to think more about the plight and lives of people of color? Won't loving or affirming themselves only increase the amount of white hubris, white pride, white selfishness, and white supremacy that exists in the world today? Not necessarily. This is not because white people have nothing in their racial past or present to feel ashamed about. They do. We do. I do. I'm not claiming that white people should never feel guilty or ashamed about their whiteness or white history but I'm claiming that guilt and shame should not be the primary effective habits that a white person cultivates to constitute her own racial identity. While white people myopically have engaged in what Adrian Rich calls white solipsism, in which only white people and their interests are recognized or seen as important, 
The best corrective for white solipsism is not necessarily for white people to do the opposite and selflessly focus only on people of color. White self-denial and self-hatred can be the flip side of the same coin of white solipsism. What's needed, I think, is for white people to develop a different kind of relationship to their whiteness. An increase of white self, and part of what's happening here, I don't know whether it keeps scare quoting or not, this dichotomy between selfish and selfless is a dichotomy that's interfering, that, that, that we need to kind of rework. Um, so if I'm using selfish, it's scare quoting a little bit to say we've got to undercut this dichotomy. So this white selfishness is needed to help prevent white involvement in anti-racist movements from becoming a disguised form of charity or a, a kind of condescension toward people of color. I mean, you can go recall, go way back to W.B. Du Bois, who had a scathing criticism of white philanthropists who regarded themselves as uplifting poor, ignoble people of color across the world. As Du Bois bitingly charges, quote, these worthy souls in whom consciousness of high descent brings burning desire to spread the gift abroad. He's talking about missionary groups, you know, taking things to Africa, for example. They receive a great deal of mental peace and moral satisfaction, still quoting, when humble black folk, voluble with thanks, receive barrels of old clothes from lordly and generous whites, end quote. But when black recipients of white charity begin to challenge white authority and accept the white gifts sullenly rather than gratefully, quote, then the spell is suddenly broken, end quote, and the true, even if unconscious, purpose of white charity is revealed. It has very little to do with genuinely increasing the flourishing of black people and everything to do with covertly, again, unconsciously in most cases, but covertly using black people to generate white people's moral sense of goodness. Instead of selflessly working for others' benefit, a person who wishes to support others' flourishing needs to turn to herself first. Now, again, I have selflessly in scare quotes here because these sharp distinctions turn out not to be very useful. Helping myself might seem to be selfish, but it can turn out to be the best way to be strong enough to benefit others. And helping others can be the best way to create an environment, not, not just physical, but social political environment, where I, I've set up a nurturing environment to benefit myself. Negative affects can be resisted without violence and love can be used to reorder aggression. This reordering happens if I first reordered myself, my habits, through love. And, and I'm going to say more about this love. This isn't necessarily, it's not romantic love. I'm talking a critical kind of love. I'm talking, um, gosh, you can go, even go back to Socrates and talk about his love for Athens. He loved it so much that he stayed there to criticize it to try and make it something better than, than it was. So don't think romantic love here, and I'm, I may not have enough time to fully sort of unpack that. Um, love can change one's constitution such that one thinks, acts, and desires in different ways than when you hate. When bodies are in agreement with one another, recipro reciprocally increasing each other's power, new constitutions are possible, constitutions that involve positive effective habits, which can lead them to believe, desire, and act differently. That's a kind of strength that comes from this love, in other words, a critical love. Now, white people need to develop this kind of selfish strength. And I'm not, I'm not only talking about or even primarily about white supremacists, but also and importantly about so -called, you know, non or anti-racist white people who tend to be part of a white middle class that sees themselves as the good white people. Good middle class white people, you know, these are the ones who are not the bad racists, you know, I'm, you know Dylan Roof is over there and I'm over here. He's killing black people. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm not a white supremacist. I'm, I'm talking about whoop, folks like that. <laughs> we good middle class white people generally lack the strength to interrupt racialized cycles of negative affects and generate positive affects instead. And so as a result, it becomes very easy to dump responsibility for racism on lower and working class white people. This is a, a little bit of what I'm talking about, about white people turning to themselves as a group and cleaning up some of the crap. So it's dumping responsibility for racism on lower and working class white people who are posited as the true source of ongoing racial injustice. It's the lower class white people, the so-called rednecks, the white trash, who are the bad racist white people. They're too un unintelligent or enlightened to know that people of color aren't inferior to white people. So with their disdain, scorn, and even hatred of so-called white trash, 
middle class white people can exploit class differences among whites to efface their own complicity in racism and white domination. Now, let me say a little bit more about class differences with respect to the use of negative affects to undergird white anti-racism. One manifestation of this use, which is a typically middle class white persons living their racial responsibilities as a grim, serious burden. Now, this probably is going to sound like a really strange thing for me to say, since responsibility customarily is seen as a serious moral matter. And in that sense of the term, however, my project here does not strive for moral responsibility. I'm not striving for irresponsibility, but I, I'm trying to interrupt um, some of these usual ways we have of thinking about these things. Customary understandings of how white people should comport themselves with regard to racism assume that white people should soberly and earnestly try to figure out how to be better people by doing the right thing about race. Should white people send their children to integrated multiracial schools? Should they make charitable donations to organizations such as, such as the NAACP? Support reparations to black Americans and Native Americans? Now these are not trivial questions, they're important, but sometimes they're asked by white people who are struggling more to improve their moral standing as white people than to improve unjust situations brought about by white racism. Or more cynically, you thought I couldn't get more cynical, but more cynically, they're asked by white people who are trying to improve their or their children's employability in an increasingly multicultural global market that requires white people to work cooperatively and comfortably with people of color. So you gotta sprinkle, make sure you sprinkle a few in so white people can get used to that because that's gonna help their employability later. I'm not kidding. To state the obvious, white people's moral standing and employability are not the same thing as ending racial injustice. But sometimes white people lose sight of the latter because of their often inchoate or unconscious desire for the former. As Steve Biko has argued in the context of racial struggles in South Africa, quote, instead of involving themselves in an all-out attempt to stamp out racism from their white supremacy, white liberals waste lots of time trying to prove to as many blacks as they can that they are liberal. In other words, the good whites, end quote. The intense focus on securing one's moral standing as a white person can produce what philosopher Charles Scott has called, quote, the awful sobriety inspired by an overheated sense of goodness, end quote. White people's somber seriousness about race sometimes is taken as proof that they are one of the good white people, not one of the bad ones, who take race too lightly and thus reveal themselves to be racist. Ironically, an overheated sense of goodness on the part of some white people can be less about taking responsibility for racism than deflecting it onto other white people who often tend to be a white lower class. In this way, middle class white people's seriousness about race sometimes can interfere with rather than aid struggles to end white racism. Their seriousness can turn out to be more of a white class marker than an effective response to trying to end white domination. So am I claiming then that white people shouldn't try to do the right thing when it comes to race, that they shouldn't try to be good? Not exactly. What I'm attempting to do instead is to carve out a different way of thinking about white people's relationships and the habits they have now in these relationships, their relationship to issues of race. White people who are concerned about racism need a different ethos. I, didn't, I deliberately didn't use the word morality here. Ethos in the sense of a set of practices, habits, a way of um, structuring one's life, a different ethos for their anti-racist efforts, a different repertoire of effective habits, ones that are not centered on dominant understandings of moral goodness. Again, as Charles Scott has argued in a broader vein, quote, to say that goodness is bad would just kind of be absurd. The badness of goodness is not the problem. Goodness names the problem here, end quote. The white person who's best able to work against white racism and solidarity with people of color isn't good. Neither is she bad or evil in the sense of flippantly disregarding racial matters or deliberately committing racist acts. We might say that she instead is a person who's constituted by a loving affirmation of herself and other white people, one that exercises and strengthens her positive rather than negative effective habits regarding race and thus allows her to digest rather than resentfully fester over impotently avoid or evasively deflect her and other white people's roles in racist institutions and histories. Now admittedly, from a dominant moral perspective, this self-affirmation, white self-affirmation, might look evil, or at least extremely inappropriate. 
but I think it's one of the tools that white people need if they're going to be useful and effective in struggles against white racism. And I should add here, white people aren't really going to be the main motor for any of this. It's going to be people of color. But one of the questions is, is there anything white people can do to help? If they're going to be useful and effective, I think this is one of the tools they're going to need. I challenge the assumption that positive affects in the pursuit of social justice necessarily conflict with one another. To the extent that dominant moral perspectives make that assumption, then um, I'm, I'm quoting um, Audrey Thompson, who uh, works in education and whiteness, quote, morality, in that case, if dominant moral perspectives make it such that we can't talk about cultivating a kind of self-affirmation, then, quote, morality is one of the main obstacles to racial change. And in that case, white people need to relinquish, still quoting, relinquish our cherished notions of morality, including how we understand what it means to be a good person, end quote. That, that's hard. <laughs> Let's just say that. That's going to be hard. What would it mean to challenge our notions of morality and how, what we understand what it means to be a good person as interfering with an ability to contribute to racial justice movements. Um, again, I know that the immoralism of this claim might sound alarming. I want to underscore this is not about mere feeling or feeling happy as a white person. The, the, the happiness or good feeling of this is, is sort of not the matter at hand. It's a question about what affect, what does an affect move a person to do? Calling for a white person to be constituted by vitalizing effective habits such as self-love is not a call for them to feel delighted about being white racist or benefiting from white privilege. In the mix of negative and positive effective habits that make up white people, it's a call for them, for us, to nourish their positive affects with regard to whiteness so that a different kind of political and personal action on their part will be possible. I'm going to skip just a little bit here so I can wind up. Um, so I've been talking about a spiral of, of affects, and instead of a negative spiral, think that shame, rage spiral, a, a positive uh, spiral. And this suggests why it's not just the case one owns, that one's own weakness often contributes to the destruction of others, but also that the destruction of others also feeds into one's weakness. From this perspective, we could say with James Baldwin that what's truly sinister, I'm sort of paraphrasing him here from the fire next time, What's truly sinister about white people is their lack of joy. Writing about the destructiveness of white people's guilt, Baldwin asserts, quote, the fact that white people have not been able to do this, to face their history, to change their lives, hideously menaces this country, talking about the United States. Indeed, it menaces the entire world, end quote. It's likely that multiple kinds of positive affect will be needed to fully change white people's lives and drastically reduce their menace to the world. The task is probably that large, but instead of being in cons constituted by negative affects, even the ones that seemingly could seem, they seem beneficial, such as guilt and shame, white people need to develop positive, effective habits with regard to their race. And I think these will be both beneficial to both white people and people of color, perhaps even the entire world. Now, would doing this uh, lead to stronger, more trusting relationships between white people and people of color? back now in some ways to thinking about love or friendship across racial lines. Not necessarily. As a part of countering white quests for salvation through anti-racist work, we need to tease apart the goal of eliminating white racism from the white desire, maybe it's a middle class white desire, a good white person's desire for increased interracial trust. As I think about questions of interracial relationships, I'm reminded of a comment made by Donna Dale Marcano, um, a, a black feminist philosopher, who was discussing at a recent conference the, reason, the reasons given by white people decades ago that black philosophy cannot or should not exist. Explaining why young black woman philosophers who are in the audience there with her, why they need to know these reasons, Marcano playfully but sincerely exclaimed, quote, I know white philosophers are all liberal nowadays, but you can't trust that, end quote. And she didn't mean liberal in the sense of are you a Democratic or a Republican, but you know, they're all, they're all good white people now. They're not saying really bad racist things in front of us anymore, but don't trust it. History supposedly has changed and white philosophers 
today and others perhaps also are accepting of alternatives to the tradition, but black people shouldn't fall for this liberal facade, Marcano tells us. As she and other black women philosophers know, there's still significant obstacles for them and for lots of other folks uh, in philosophy, but who want to join and transform the discipline. I think her claim that black people shouldn't fully trust white people's right on target, but white people still can and need to work for racial justice, and I think Marcano would agree with that. So then you're, I'm, I'm teasing apart this idea, is trust the goal, or is making some kind of effective change in the world the goal? And, and these have been conflated a lot of times, and I think they're separate. The assumption that white people must have non-white non -white people of color's trust before they can fight white racism, I think is yet another manifestation of the good white person's toxic quest for racial redemption and freedom from self-hatred through relationships of pe with people of color. White people can make significant contributions toward achieving racial justice by getting their own house in order. People of color don't need white people to save them and they don't need to use up their energy and resources trying to save white people in return. As Tim Weiss, an, a white, he's, who's a white activist for racial justice, has argued, quote, it's not about trying to save others. I'm really trying to save and redeem the community that I live in. He's talking about a white community. So that that community can join with communities of color in a real sense of equity and not a paternalistic arrangement. Here's the crap quote. We have to be able to clean up the crap between whites, end quote. Okay, so this is not something that most good white people want to hear uh, in closing. White recounts a story, this is a good story. White recounts a story that underscores this point, and I think it also confirms what Marcano was saying about interracial trust. While giving a presentation on whiteness to a predominantly white college audience, a young white woman asked Wise how his work was received by black people, and she admitted that she didn't think she could do the same sort of work because black people wouldn't trust her. Wise replied that while there occasionally was some mistrust, he never felt hated or resented once black people had seen him, seen him work and walk the walk, not just talk the talk. At that point, an extremely agitated black woman raised her hand and responded, make no mistake, we do hate you and we don't trust you not for one minute, end quote. The young white woman who asked the initial question was so distressed she nearly fell apart. The black woman's response apparently confirmed all of her worst fears as a good white person. Wise, this is what's interesting, Wise kind of calmly replied to the black woman, he was sorry to hear this, but it was okay since he ultimately wasn't fighting racism for the sake of non-white people. Okay, and then hearing this, the entire audience sort of snapped to attention uh, as if a bomb had been dropped in the room and even the agitated black woman looked puzzled. So Wise continued, quote, I mean no respect, I mean no disrespect by saying that. It's, mm, the volume just changed, didn't it? I don't know why. Maybe so I could really make that point. <laughs> make, okay. I mean no disrespect by saying that. It's just that I don't view it as my job to fight racism or to save you from it. That would be paternalistic. I fight racism because it's a sickness in my community and I'm trying to save myself from it." End quote. Now on a dominant understanding of morality, Wise's reply appears to selfishly care for himself and his racial group more than he cares about the black woman and other black people. This is why his audience was shocked by his reply to the black woman's mistrust. In addition to being uncaring and selfish, at least on a dominant understanding, Wise doesn't prioritize the establishment of close trusting relationships between himself and other people of color as a goal, or maybe even a means of his activist work. I, I think some of those did result sometimes, but it's not why he went into it as this is my goal, is to make sure I'm friends with black people by the, you know, by the end of this week or something. <laughs> On a conventional understanding of how white anti-racism should operate, the distance, the distance that Wise allows between himself and people of color makes his activism ineffective at best and scandalous at worst. But we can view Wise's reply in his activist work through the lens of a different ethos, one that encourages white people's selfish attention to their own race and understands the importance of white self-love to, uh, to their work for racial justice. Wise is fighting for white people's racial health rather than their racial goodness, we might say, and he sees that their improved health will make them better able to join with communities of color in a relationship of genuine respect rather than paternalistic domination. Now, most white people, including myself, aren't currently capable of joyfully exclaiming with Hurston that they love themselves qua white, 
but we'd better hope that someday they, we will be. <coughs> Selfishly cleaning up our own house is one of the best ways that white people today can contribute to racial justice and transform the meaning and effects of whiteness. In philosopher Lucius Outlaw's terms, it's the way that whiteness can be, as he called it, rehabilitated. Or re and think about what that word means. It means return to a condition of good health. I'm not sure that whiteness has ever been very healthy, as I think Outlaw would agree. So the return here is very much in question, but the sickness and the need for better health are not. White people have been ill from white domination for centuries. If they're to recover, they need answers to the question of what a healthier whiteness might, might be. Answers, in Outlaw's words, quote, that must be taken up and lived by folks who identify as white. He has this wonderful essay which basically is like, white people get off your rear ends and do something. You gotta do something with this whiteness and don't, don't wait for black people to do it for you. This is not work that white people can ask or demand that people of color do for them, which is not to say that white people don't have a great deal to learn about themselves from non-white people, people of color, they do. While they cannot do this work in a white solipsistic vacuum, white people need to develop a new ethos and new effect, effective habits as part of their white identities. No one else can live their whiteness for them. So what will they, we, I, do with it? I think the best answers to this question will be ones that emerge apart from the dominance of effective habits of white guilt and shame. By developing a type of critical self-love that helps transform whiteness, white people can make positive and ongoing contributions to struggles for racial justice. Thank you. <laughs>